welcome to this latest episode of Chasing Creativity. I'm Kiran Manral, your host. Today I have not one but two guests. The fab duo of Raj and DK, whose latest series Guns and Gulabs just dropped on Netflix. With a penchant for pushing boundaries, Raj and DK have mastered the art of storytelling that captivates audiences worldwide. They brought us a range of films that defy traditional categorizations from the quirky zombie comedy Go Go Agon to the action-packed Shore in the City and the incredibly popular espionage thriller series The Family Man. What sets them apart is their ability to infuse their creations with a distinct Indian flavor while maintaining a global appeal. Their innovative vision has not only caught the attention of audiences but also garnered critical acclaim. And we're very very excited to have them on the show to talk about their creativity, their creative process and much more. Welcome to Chasing Creativity, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you because I've admired your work and I've seen how you've sort of pushed the boundaries when we didn't even know boundaries existed with things like gone go go are gone. And that was so incredible to see. And I've always wondered two boys from India who went and studied abroad in your studied engineering i think you studied a film but you studied in no, both of us no, no, both of us studied engineering. engineering how did film happen to you how did you come together and how did you decide to come back and make films i think uh, the single word a- a- answer is uh, boredom <laughs> uh, or monotony okay uh, uh, actually the, the it was all it was like a, a path was laid out i felt like entire life was planned and laid out in front of us that many many had followed many many had done that before so now it was our turn like you study well get your good ranks good grades top whatever try and top the university get your masters then you go get the it job get the house get the van get married get kids so the whole uh, path was laid out and and we had a really cushy jobs right yeah i know pretty good high paying jobs and nice jobs but uh see I, i think i think what i can say is that everybody who we grew up in the state of andhra pradesh and yes. everybody who grows up in the state of andhra pradesh is secretly a filmmaker at heart okay yeah i i think that's pretty much every person in andhra and i would say that true for tamil nadu as well we are all crazy about movies as as a people we are crazy about movies and everybody wants to everybody has a dream of making a movie and i think we were lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time we were in the us having these good jobs making a lot decent amount of money and suddenly we felt all the responsibilities being lifted away and this was also the uh, at the turn of the century this was also the cusp of the digital revolution where you had access to digital video cameras and digital editing systems and suddenly we felt that there was nothing stopping us mm-hmm. from making a film if we wanted to Like, and the difference is like you were saying that most of us or everybody thinks they're a filmmaker we all talk about the edits and how well the movie could have been made and there's a whole discussion about it everyone everyone is a part of filmmaking in 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 in, in andhra so th- i think the difference was you know earlier people your friends used to ask how come you did this how did you do this how, where mm-hmm. did you start moving into actually making films making the movies i think the, the difference was that we used, everybody used to discuss and we used to write it down uh-huh. that was it. that was the first switch that where we actually started writing down ideas like i always say that i had a like almost 10 12 diaries all kinds of cool books to write different different ideas a different idea will go into a blue book another red book will have other ideas so it was a slightly organized way of capturing thoughts over years there is still no 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 plan to become a filmmaker it was more of you know what hey let me write it down i have a thought i have a visual or oh, that person is quite interesting so it was just the way of capturing ideas and thoughts for a while so did you all train at all in filmmaking <laughs> no so we watched a lot of films that was the <laughs> that training, <was> the training. <laughs> <laughs> what were your influences in filmmaking who were the ones that you really admired and looked up to in terms of directors actors whatever See, around that time like uh, again like i said the early 2000s um around that time there were a lot of these uh, in the filmmakers uh finding their voice uh it, that like i said that's also a virtue of us being in the right time or the right place uh, there was this whole american indie movement a lot of the most famous directors that you're seeing today right from christopher nolan to steven soderbergh to robert rodriguez even tarantino maybe like five years earlier than that but um david fincher and doug liman all these people that are big directors today were making their first or 
you know, or their initial films, their formative films. Even, even films. Inyaritu, right? Ah, Inyaritu, I mean, Kiwaron, like literally every visionary director that you Anybody know. Anybody right now that you see that you think they have a special vision or voice, they were all making their first films around that time, plus or minus five years. But that 10-year period was an extremely strong independent moment is what we felt that drew us because you, we were watching mainstream films. You're watching all these big action spectacles, the whole theatrical you know, films. But thankfully, those days, theaters were still playing these other mm-hmm. films. And so you're watching all these and you're thinking there is this cinema too, that it doesn't have to be the mainstream just meant for like let's say just to make some money or whatever but the independent films had a bit more there was a, they, were, they were unique they were all unique yet entertaining so we knew and, and they were all indie homegrown projects right, right. like Soderbergh's first film was Sex License Videotape okay. which is a very low budget film but Robert classic. Rodriguez I forgot to mention he made a, made a film with his neighbor's borrowed camera and some amateur actors and he did some medical experiments to raise money to make the film and you read about all this it's very 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 inspirational to read about it and then you realize that uh, at least we are better off than them in terms of having a little more money because we have well-paying jobs all we need to do now is learn filmmaking so, from so, them from, from watching them. their yeah, films and, and what <laughs> yeah. we used to do is we used to be in two different cities we, we went to the same college in India and then we again connected in America so and we have two different cities and uh, we used to start talking. We didn't even have a plan. It was more like, they, it, right now, anybody gets an idea, they'll say, let's make a movie, right? At that point, it was a far off idea because you're not connected. Mm-hmm. All you're thinking is, we should do something fun. No, like what? We don't know. Let's write something. Do we know how to write? No. Okay, let's figure out how to write. It was like almost that, you know, pick a book and say, how do you write a screenplay? you would be like, okay, we'll start from here. <laughs> and we don't know what else to do after that. <laughs> you read you read two chapters and you're like, okay, I've read plenty. Now I know, I know how to make it. <laughs> you don't finish the book. I had, <laughs> I had so many books on film and they were all first chapters were read. <laughs> uh, and then we start doing something, things like, um, now we want to make a film, uh, like a short film or something. And we really are not connected to any film organization. We don't know the existence of film organizations for the first couple of years, I think. So, so what we do? What do we do? We go to Walmart or Best Buy, pick up some uh, mics and make our own little boomstick, like a bias stick, and tie it around so it becomes a, a mic. We we buy these lights. We don't know if the what halogen or not. We don't know what it is, but we buy lights to make sure that it's not shadows are not hitting you. And we realize, oh God, it's a horrible shadow. What do we do with that? <laughs> so, oh, we should put another light here so that shadow goes away. So it was this level of reinventing the wheel. Uh, and it was fun. But I think that also worked to your advantage because you came in with no preconceived notions of how things needed to be done and how they were done. And you just yeah, made your own yeah. language. No, that, yeah, that sometimes is. not knowing how to do things might force you to do it in a way, in the only way you know how to do it. And, you know, if you're lucky, people like that. And you're like, and oh, you. It might look original. In a different you know? way. Like, I'm not a genius. I just didn't know how else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, you might just be original. You might just do because you don't know how no, else to do. That's so wonderful. I mean, that's so heartening that you took that leap of faith at that point of time. You know, everybody would say, well paid, settled jobs. Don't and, get up. And, sorry, and to add to that, like I was saying, not just these American indies, that was also the time of all these uh, Indian crossover films that were um. happening. So there was a there was a, just this blooming of a lot of independent cinema that was happening. A lot of Indians in America or Indians from India were making these very low budget first films kind of a thing. And so you're seeing this happening around you and uh, that that played a big role. Okay. Like they say, like the 70s was the new wave of cinema where uh, uh, Spielberg and Scorsese and Lucas and all these famous people, the big people today, their first films happened in the 70s. And I like to think that the late 90s to say the noughts mm. was another wave Absolute. that happened. Absolutely. When you made your movies, your first movies, and then you decided to come down to India and to make your movies here, you broke into an industry that is almost a cabal. How easy or difficult was it? I mean, your work spoke for itself, of course, but it is a very closed industry. So It was very a- difficult, actually. And especially we are outsiders with, forget about being part of the industry. We're not even from Bombay. Huh. Our Hindi at that time, Mumbai, I should say, at the, our Hindi at that time was 
possible at best. Like my knowledge of Hindi came from learning Hindi in school. Like I thought Hindi. your Hindi came from Mahabharat. Huh? <laughs> watching yeah. Ramayana and, and Mahabharat. And watching Ramayana <laughs> and Mahabharat on television. That's my that's my source of knowledge for Hindi. So yeah, if either of us started, started speaking in Hindi, it would sound very odd, I think, at that time. <laughs> But somehow we we understood it well. I don't know yeah. why, but we could see, and there was also a grasp of uh, the fact that when Hindi was spoken in films, we we were here trying to make a film and watching films in theaters, and we realized that uh, they, they were kind of sounding the same, like it was written, like dialogues were being spoken. At least some of the films were like dialogues were being spoken versus people talking uh, normally, and so we thought, hey, we shouldn't do that. We should try and be more natural, even if we don't know Hindi. So we actually used to call up for our first film, 99. I say this often that we used to call up friends and my cousin in Delhi and I used to call up and say, how do you say this line? Because, and then you type it up. Or like I said in bad Hindi, bad grammar, and they'll correct it. So it started becoming very uh, real, a little more real and fun. And, you know, you could relate to these lines better, even though we didn't have like punch lines and, you know, those dramatic dialogues again it's a it's a question of us not no not being part of the system not knowing how hindi film dialogues are, are written or how dialogues are spoken also gave us the opportunity to say it like we say it right mm. just like the short film we made a short film because we thought okay now uh, we were outsiders no clue we just come here and say i want to meet ram gopal verma and they're like i don't know how so you sit. Then we'll say, I want to meet Mani Ratnam. So we don't know how. You just sit around. So what we thought we should do is write. Let's just write it. And I hear that people don't have scripts fully done. So let's write our scripts really, really well. But in like a bound script. And not just one. Let's make, let's write two. Okay. Two different genres. So that this is our engineering at work. Right. So you make two scripts. So, so that you have two chances now to do it. So uh, once we do it, we realize that, okay, nobody knows us. Anybody we're meeting, they're saying, who did you work with? Did you go to film school? We'd be like, yeah, we did. We, we, we just nod when they said they went to film school. I said, <laughs> Where sure. are you from? We are from America. Oh, you went to film school there. Uh -huh. Sure. Uh -huh. Probably. Lies of omission. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we used to fake resumes in IT to get a job, right? All Indians fake their resumes in IT. It's like, because nobody takes you. Yeah. What, Over what are you two years for? of experience in this, this, this. Only then you take. Yeah, it's, you like, it's like you have a resume and like, what are you hiring for? Oh, you're hiring for SAP. Wait. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. I have three years of experience. So That's therefore you had film school training in America. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's that. Uh, so uh, like he was saying that when we, we decided to make, again, we thought, what can we do to be seen or heard or understood that we are filmmakers and we might have some filmmaking talent in us. So we made a short film all by ourselves. Like, and at that point, just pull out some money and made a short film called Shore. We went to an FTII screening and recruited everybody. Let's get him. Let's get him. Let's get him. It's like that. Like people walking around and saying that, that, that. They're all actors. And then we got a DOP from there. And we just shot. Like we didn't know better. So we just took the camera. Two cars. Uh, going around with four people each. Finding a location. Getting down and shooting a scene. Oh, till wonderful. we were caught. Right? So we went, we went and shot a scene in train also. We went inside, got inside the train, started shooting in local train. We didn't, know. we didn't know we, were, we, we, we cannot. Okay. That was so strange that finally when we went to a over, overpass and were shooting a wide shot and the cop came and said, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we made one. That was the key. That okay. was the final key that people, we could get it to actors to watch it. And then they realized, oh, this is very good. How come? Who are these guys? And then we would show that short film and say, make this script. Not the same script because that script was too raw and indie. We wanted to make 99. Mm -hmm. So, but they bought in that these guys can make a film. And so On that's how. Of that short film. But it took five years for it that took journey. Five years. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Because we had to go back. We had to go back to America, make some more money because. We ran out of money. We've spent everything on our first uh, shorts and first film and all. So we came back, made a little more money because didn't want to do odd jobs to make money, spend time on actually trying to so get So it was just on. making money. We knew how to make money. We had a good <laughs> opportunity to make money by going back to consulting software. Yeah. So we went back, sat there for almost two, two and a half years, went back after our first that uh, little experimental film we had made. We went back and then sat for two years, worked with the pure goal of not having a career, but just making as much money as you can. 
so that you can stop everything and come and survive in Bombay for another two or three years because we realize that's how long it's going to take. So it was five. It, it almost took us five years as a journey to to get the first finally get the, the first film going. Yeah. And there were many actors we had met and a lot of people, varying levels of interest. They loved the script, but at some point they're not sure who are these newcomers. I mean, I don't know. Can I risk making a film? So there was a lot of people that almost did it. There are people that didn't do it, and eventually the film happened. And look where yeah. you're today. Mm-hmm. What a fabulous journey. I read somewhere, I forget whether it was Raj or UTK, uh, gentlemen didn't do well. And one of you, I don't know who it was, went to a barista and started writing Sri Oh, Sri Kalana. Kalana. Sri Kalana, yeah. yeah. So do you believe that the story finds you and something channels a story to you? Because that's a very surreal kind of a moment, isn't it? That... Uh, the story uh, more, just came to you. Uh, no, no. The, 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 we have many stories that are in our head. They keep brewing over time. There are some ridiculous ones that won't make sense. So this is one of them that was it's not a story. It was just an incident that had happened mm-hmm. when we were in college and school in, in my hometown. And But there was no great idea behind it except for our silly, uh, ridicu- uh, silly uh, happenings at night. There was no point to it. So the point came... It, the point struck like in where suddenly there was a social commentary in it that suddenly there was a, g- a gender uh, reversal in it where the the ghost became almost like a feminist in a way that she would only go after men and the men are the ones that are scared to venture out at night and they'll be asking their wives to say can you come along i don't want to go alone or they'll be draping saris to look like women so they're not get they don't get caught so that idea is the new idea that came on top of an existing fun thought that was just a fun film could never be made wouldn't have made it so um yeah so no that, that was that mm, was also kind of us uh, reinventing or picking up re- the pieces because we re- knew like on the going day of back the lo- to where we started on the right? day a, a gentleman launched we knew it was not doing well because i mean besides many other reasons bombay was washed out there was like I don't know, two stories deep water okay, in so Bombay and there were riots in the north in Delhi and Punjab, uh, other areas. So, uh, I mean, it was like trouble after trouble. So we knew uh, this weekend. Plus we gone. had... Uh, and, uh, but also what had happened, um, see earlier we were doing kind of a certain kind of film, be it 99 or Short in the City or Go Go Gone. We were making films that were not somehow fitting into the mainstream mold and standing out on their own. And I think after that these two films that we made, Happy Ending and A Gentleman, were our way of kind of trying to fit into the uh, mainstream. Main. Basically, in, the, in Gentleman itself, you have a story. If you take out the packaging, the, the layering of it, the top part, you have a fun story. But you also made it, we also made it uh, fun and songs and music, right? And, and uh, locales and all. Again, we've tried to f- make it See, very I'm proud organic. Of it. I'm proud of both of these films. And, but except maybe... Maybe somewhere it's the packaging. Maybe it's looking too mainstream, but not mainstream enough. I don't know. It's very, I mean, everything in hindsight, right? I mean, 2020 hindsight. But uh, so that's where we decided, okay, now let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to how we made Gogo Agon. Just do it on our own. Find that story that appeals to us. Forget about packaging it. Forget about this big summer blockbuster idea. That's how we went back to three. That's how you went back. Yeah. There's a line I read from one of your interviews. And I'm going to read it out. Asterix and Tintin became the fodder for the style of humor and action we still respond to. (laughs) And I see in your work, there is humor and horror. There is humor and thriller. There is humor, again, crime. It's a very delicate balance. How do you manage to pull it off? I mean, it's not something that can be explained. (laughs) It has to be organic. The only way humor can work in any of these subjects, the toughest one is the family man. Hmm. Because you have diametrically, we were told when a big showrunner from the US had uh, read our Bible, said, you can't do it like this. You have to take the family out of this or keep the family to 10%. Mm-hmm. You, there are no shows out there that on, on spies or the, the homeland security or whatever it is, the whole protecting mm-hmm. the country, that kind of genre. You don't have, you always, they always run like a thriller or a drama. There is no humor in it. There is no, they don't, you don't spend so much time on the family in a way. You pick the genre you want because this is not a genre. You are now going into 
bunch of genres so it doesn't make sense so it made us think for a second there is no precedence there hmm. was no other show out there in the in in the world where this this elements were together even as a feature film yeah. even even in feature films so yeah, because it, could, yeah. it gets pretty serious right the family man gets very serious and it gets deep and a lot of things explored as the show goes but the humor you don't find it forced yes and it's a natural everyday humor yeah. that comes in and in general i think the world across i think american cinema is like that it's usually when they go for horror they go for horror if it's a relationship drama it's a relationship drama it's a comedy it's a comedy romantic so but i think uh that's where indian cinema or asian cinema are just just the way we all operate we differentiate the, the only the only yeah. time they actually have humor would be that uh, it becomes a spoof you mm. make a spoof mm. you make a spice yeah. spoof or no, like something you're a comedy else. right yeah, so. you're not a, you're not a drama With you're not an action drama comedy mm. so you're, i think we yeah. just started looking right from the beginning even the show short film for for 99 flavor show in the city any of these things we were looking at looking at it with a lens of a bit a sense of humor that's it show in the city is a good example because go go gone it's a comedy but show in the city is you know people have made films on the city of mumbai because it's always so inspiring um it was inspiring for us too we came as nri sitting here and everything was hitting us i was taking so many pictures added to those notes now i used to do photos everywhere i go and they i used to like cut newspapers like 10 every day morning we used to have like five papers each go just read through find all the f- strange stuff like it's only inherent in india and mumbai and then cut all those we had so many clips what what is the story now right so that's how show in the city was formed but the, there is a sense of humor to it uh, there is you have a little bit of uh, a touch of that everything can be looked like that i feel you can look at this scenario right now and make a a little funny scene out of this even though we're talking serious business here right uh, uh, because see. my maybe this coffee is too hot and i'm struggling to sip it as i do it my focus is here <laughs> and if i shoot it the scene like this this could be funny too right and it's funny in everything i think farzi had that very funny moments when he's they're actually talking about you know how difficult it is to be poor and middle class right at the beginning of mm-hmm. it but there's so much humor in that even in guns and gulabs yesterday the gentleman comes to his new job but they don't have a garland to welcome him mm. because the garland has been ordered it's a little bit of humor oh, yeah. that's so touching and so funny <laughs> one final question on process how do you all work together how are the responsibilities divided what is your creative process like no there is no division of responsibility i think okay so yeah. you'll meld everything together and you'll work uh, yeah so we we're, we're both we're both capable of doing everything we both uh kind of end up doing everything but there is an easy handoff it's not that saying both do the same thing every time it's just that there is a there is an easy easy handoff like you know like i start off doing something and then he can pick it up from there and then you know i can pick it up from there so it's it's there is no formula to it it's just just that comfort of uh being able to pass it on like if you ask our actors you'll get a better answer for this like a okay. uh, lot of times they think both of us are on set and they won't know when one person has gone or when another person has come in and so it's it's a very seamless process for everybody else mm-hmm. but the approach to filmmaking we try and be organized we we approach it a little more systematically then there is more uh, we need that organizational approach coming to guns and gulabs yeah what made you all come up with the idea of a character like panadari tipu and setting it in this 90s retro world and of course you said pulp it's pulpy it's retro it's a mishmash of various styles how did the story come about guns and gulabs is a venting like it was just like for us we wanted to just do one unbridled unhinged just open comedy that anything goes everything goes because the family man had a serious business farzi had a, a cinematic story to tell this one was just let's go back to what we used to do in 99 and stuff like that and uh, that's where it, that, that's the idea of guns and gulabs in terms of yeah, just just also, being uh, yeah. and also what's intrinsic to this particular story is the there's a certain level of innocence mm-hmm. in all the characters mm-hmm. and so it's kind of like a throwback to simpler times when people were simpler and the times were simpler okay. like which is like literally 1990 uh 
and that's why even the bad guys there is a there is an element of innocence in them or naivete they just don't know better mm. and uh, that was in, inherent like in, intrinsic to the story that's why that era lends itself nicely to it there were no cell phones there's no quick communication everything is a little old fashioned you have to write a letter, letter. to convey your love so, lovely yeah. that was very lovely uh, is the title a hat trip to guns and roses Sorry, it's a hat tip to the the entire uh, show is a hat tip to times to the times eighties. Okay, and, uh, it's set in nineteen ninety. So we we were uh, uh, nodding, we're giving our nods to the eighties stuff. Of course, Guns and Roses. All of us were Guns and Roses fans, and the funny part is we're from a very small town where we would have. proper telugu music but we would also go to an audio library to do a mixtape and put in these songs so we had our own list of playlist right our yeah. original playlist so it, we really wanted to put that into a small town where an english song doesn't belong in a in in a film in a show or a film like this you like you would never hear an english song in a in a setting yes. like this but that made it even more interesting so we actually had to get rights for these okay, uh, uh, songs, the rights, the songs to actually play in the series and of course uh, and we wanted to be a little cheesy in the title because this is like as we say we call this a crafted cheese <laughs> uh, where you could be loud you you can be like fanfare music you know music wise it's fanfare bigger shots people with flares and people killing and, and the bad guy freezes. thinks is khalnayak so we <laughs> right? went, he styles himself after khalnayak right i mean absolutely yeah. <laughs> so hence the and we wanted to make it sound like an english hindi thing like guns and gulabs so it became guns and roses to guns lovely there's a very strong element of destiny in the series tipu does not want to follow his father into the business yeah. wittingly unwittingly he gets thrown into it and drawn into this world of it sort of reminded me of you know amitabh bachchan ke tep mera baap chor hai so yeah. any sort of i mean how do you handle this theme of destiny and predestination in your films when you're also trying to you know show that a person has made a conscious choice to go that way see that's part of the uh, see that that's all that is a quite organic part of how with how the characters developed and how the story developed and see there is no particular film from that era that's an inspiration of any kind but uh the inspiration is from the times from the people and from the lives of the people but but growing up the way we grew up in the south movies were a big influence on all of us and i'm sure it's like that for the rest of the country too and uh so films do part of, form a part of the culture so there is a lot of film references and people trying to be like uh, the their heroes in the films that they watched and all that but so while it's a hat tip to a lot of the films from that era and to that era in general uh, i don't think there's anything that's specific or particular about any mm-hmm. you know any the particular the destiny film. part yes it does i think our 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 stories tend to have a bit of what can i say the word a bit of spiritual slash existential thoughts in it it's been there since sure in the city um subliminally sometimes subconsciously sometimes sometimes maybe as design in this case destiny plays a big deal for everybody there is a certain certain uh even for others you know he doesn't he doesn't he's in he doesn't want to do what uh, what he supposed to do even dulkar's uh storyline you will realize he doesn't want to do what he wants to do he this is what he wants a simple life uh, even atma ram is has there is a whole double meaning to us as creators there's more to him than mm-hmm. what you see and of course it's not like it it will be evident in this in the series but there's a thought behind why is he atma ram you know why is this four cuts what is it about so there is a bit more thought and a bit of spirituality there somewhere i think um so yeah yeah so we'll have to watch the series to find out <laughs> yeah What is the core message that you want people to take away from the series if any of course you want them to be entertained but is there something that you want them to take away that that we're all gray that uh, 90s parents son mein hai shaitan mm. that's the i mean that's the chapter title of the first chapter is also a line that features in the trailer yeah. and and in 90s were especially the films where things were quite or uh, 80s were quite black and white bad guy yeah. good guy very black that's it here. honest cop good son and they never waver they yeah, will arrest your mother if you have to 
you know they do that so the idea is is to also take the black and white characters that we are used to including the bad guy and try and make them a bit more human and maybe just accept the gray side of it or at least go on a ride with them to their gray maybe dark side of them lovely you shot it in dehradun at the peak of the pandemic how difficult was that and what were the challenges of shooting during the pandemic shooting during the pandemic in itself is a huge challenge of course right i mean just the number of rules and regulations and how many people can be together right it's very hard to even communicate with the actor because we're all wearing masks and maintaining social distance and now you know what i mean now imagine a crew coming in and everybody coming in yeah but i mean but even you know it was also like now the third wave so people had figured out uh, at least procedures to keep in place how what all you do to avoid uh, the spread of the you know uh, of covid and we we followed all procedures we had a team specifically health and safety team for covid precautions and there were all kinds of things happening and uh when we were shooting every single person on the crew got covid once okay. so there was still no avoiding it in the third wave like i got it he was holding fort he got it i was holding fort the dop got it the second dop was holding fort the production designer got it the second his immediate assistant was holding fort so somehow had uh, we somehow had two two people somehow i think it is part of the plan because we are shot for z then and through the we are shot for z through 2021 through the second wave or at least we had to wait out the second okay. wave when, when things reopen we shot it okay so going towards the end of the year we knew that if there was another wave coming we should beef up our thing so we always tried to get uh the good hod like a good dop and everybody the head of department is good and have one really really capable number 2 person just in case the number 1 person is indisposed for a couple of days we can still shoot and uh, that's there's two of us anyway naturally and uh so we we made sure that every department had a very strong number 2 and it really helped us i read somewhere and i think that also holds true in what i've watched of your work that the mobile phone a communication plays a very important role it's like a lead motive almost <laughs> in most of your shows yeah, and your movies first, first, looks 19. like yeah <laughs> this time somebody summarized it yeah, that yeah. we had a character in our we had a recurring character in our stories films and series that's the mobile phone that's and mobile. we've always used it to a hilarious extent 99 has some such crazy funny jokes about calling network and, and each other and missing and and Guns and Gulabs, as far as I can see, is set in the pre-mobile era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have the telephone. Do you think you've used the telephone in the same way? No. In fact, what they did was by taking out the phone from the story, uh, the scenes uh, were written differently. The scenes formed differently by themselves. Uh, so that's what the fun was. That uh, many scenes won't exist if you put a phone in. The if you just give the phone to the bad guy or the the, the protagonist, the scene won't exist. So yeah, that must have been quite a different challenge for you to work. Yeah, it's around. fun. It's fun. We have to challenge ourselves. As creative people, we've been hearing a lot about AI. How do you see it? Is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? How does it work for you? Any AI, AI? any innovation it's, is it's inevitable, uh, right? I mean, it's bound to happen, and uh, I think rightfully so. I mean, especially in Hollywood right now, everybody's going on strike to get certain rights, you know, assured. uh knowing that ai is going to come i don't think there's anybody who's trying to stop ai from coming all they know is when ai comes certain things are going to change we need to be protected like for example a broad stroke example if an actor feels that is going to be replaced by ai in future like your likeness your voice can be created by a computer without needing you the actor is saying i can't stop it from happening but you better pay me for doing it because you're still using my likeness which i mean you know that i think that's the larger discourse there and uh it happens right i mean what, every generation or even beyond like i would say maybe 100 years ago when mechanized like uh assembly lines in the manufacturing industry was happening all the people were feeling that they're going to lose their jobs so there would have been a huge you know turmoil mm-hmm. around that time but i don't think you can stop development from happening so it is bound to happen if not now little later when I mean, digital came there were people who were talking about the death of film or trying to protect film but what happens eventually happens 
this is like the technological industrial revolution of our times yeah, it's always there's always one that happens and you have to uh, we hope that it's done used in the right way yeah and you are if you either you embrace it or you're forced to embrace it forced to embrace it wise words finally tell me about citadel and your upcoming projects what are, what can we expect from rajan dk next we finished our shoot on the indian segment of uh, citadel Still? okay almost finished there's like 3 days left but that's next week um so i mean what more can i say so we are in post production on that there are a couple more shows that are in development uh, for netflix for netflix itself. and of course we are working on family man season 3 we have and, a show uh, called gulkanda tales that's also pretty much ready to go that's going to be on netflix itself that's on amazon that's on amazon Prime. yeah so family man gulkanda tales yeah citadel. i think the order would be citadel i don't know the order but i'm just saying citadel and gulkanda tales are in post production and uh, we are writing the family man 3 and we have to get to guns and gulabs and farzi and actually it's going it's stressing me out i don't think <laughs> i want to answer the question yeah. and there's a feature film we are planning to put on the floors later this year that's uh, we are very excited about it right i mean we've been raring to make a feature film as well because we've been making all these series, series. and it's been kind of back to back and it's been hard to find time to do this but uh um it's getting ready so hopefully we'll put a feature film on the floors by the end of this year that's also a very fun film that we are uh, can't wait to get it on get it going yeah can't wait to watch it thank you so much for that wonderful conversation raj and dk and wishing you all the very best with guns and gulabs folks do watch it it just dropped on netflix and with that this is a wrap on this episode of chasing creativity this is kiran manral signing out Do listen in to this episode on Binchpot, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and wherever you get your audio content. See you next week. Bye.